Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is an interview with Jennifer Anderson, who is a registered dietitian, and you may know her better as the founder of Kids Eat in Color, which is an amazing Instagram account that last time I checked, I think they had 1.8 million followers. So Jennifer is really one of the experts in this space, the space that is of feeding kids and picky eating and the division of responsibility. We mentioned the division of responsibility in the episode. I don't think that we said what it was. So in case you don't know, the division of responsibility was developed by Ellen Satter. And it's basically, you can look it up online, but the basic premise is that the parent's responsibility is they decide what the kids eat, when and where, and the kids decide if they eat it and how much. That's the that's the breakdown of the division of responsibility. And that's what uh, Jennifer and I do refer to that. I also want to give you a heads up that Jennifer was having some connectivity issues. So hopefully we have put the put the podcast together in a way that sounds good and makes sense. But we we had to restart a disconnect and got disconnected and had to restart three times. So uh, just a just a little note in case it sounds a little funny, that's why. So Jennifer is, you know, as I mentioned, one of the leading experts in the space of picky eating. I've really been thinking a lot differently about picky eating recently. If you attended my uh, summit about parenting complex kids, you heard that we had, you know, we, we discussed it a little bit, a little bit in a different way than we have previously. And one thing that's really informing my thinking about the division of responsibility and about picky eating in general is, you know, it can be one of those things where It's the adults, you know, adults having more power and more control in a relationship than children, which can inform how we feed our kids. And also another huge thing that informs how we feed our kids that we don't even recognize a lot of times is diet culture. So I've been really thinking about that a lot and doing some reading about it and listening to different podcasts and thinking about, you know, how we can be coercive with how we feed children and also thinking a lot about neurodivergence and how that fits in with how we feed kids and picky eating and how the division of responsibility might not work for everyone. So I was almost hesitant to bring Jennifer on the show because from what I could see on her Instagram, she really teaches a very straight model of the division of responsibility and that we should always try to get kids to eat more, you know, vegetables and fruits and, you know, sort of what you would imagine from that space. But I decided that I wanted to have her on and I asked her some really hard questions. This is a longer than normal (laughs) introduction I am aware, but I wanted to ask her some hard questions and it was a great conversation. It was filled with nuance that I think gets missed a lot on social media and Jennifer was was very gracious in answering my difficult questions. So basically what we talked about, what you're going to hear us talk about is the areas that you bring me that stress you out about feeding kids. So we talked about kids who don't eat a very big variety of foods, the so-called classic picky eaters. We talked about when kids either eat, quote, too much or too little. We talked about meeting nutritional needs and how much do kids need to eat and of what kinds of food to get those nutritional needs met. We talked about, quote, good food and, quote, bad food. So this is a really interesting conversation, and I hope that you enjoy it. If you do, please share it with a friend. And as always, anytime you leave us podcast rating on Apple or Spotify, it helps us to reach more families. So I would love it if you could share with a friend, share this episode on social media, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts and rate us on Spotify. That would be, it's one of the best ways you can support the show. So let's dive in and meet Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited excited to talk about all things feeding kids and food today. So just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. So my name is Jennifer Anderson. 
I'm a registered dietitian, the founder of Kids Eat Color, and I have two exciting boys who I love very much, and I've learned so much about feeding from them. And that's, they're really the start of Kids Eat Color. So yeah, I love your, I follow you on Instagram and you've got, and I get your newsletters as well. And I just love your, your work. And I think it's, we often send people to your resources when they're having an issue. So it's really nice to have you here talking to me and to our listeners. So I thought what we could do is just frame it in the way of some, some common things that come up when in our community or when I'm coaching of stressful stressful things that parents worry about when they're feeding kids. So I thought we Mm -hmm. could just touch on a few of those and I could get your input and best practices on those, if that sounds okay. Because really, I, it's such a, I mean, as you know, because you have a whole business around it, it's such a point of stress and worry for parents, like Mm -hmm. what kids are eating, if they're eating, how much they're eating, like if it's too much, too little and all that stuff. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't think it has to be as stressful as sometimes it is. So maybe we'll be able to help some parents out here. Yeah, yeah. So one one thing, maybe I'll just list off for the listeners, I'll just list off the four things I wanted to touch on. Encouraging a variety of foods, meeting nutritional needs, good quote, good food versus bad food, and kids when they're eating quote, too much or too little. Those are like the mm-hmm. four areas that I really hear a lot of people talking yeah. about. So maybe we could just start out with the variety of food. Like I know you you recommend the division of responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. In your in your work and we do as well. And I guess one thing that I was that I wonder about with maybe we could start out with a variety of foods is there's so much emphasis on trying to get kids to try new foods. And I guess sometimes like, I mean, my kids are older. My youngest is 16 now. So I'm totally through the years of like kind of even controlling what they eat, like they eat whatever they want now. But yeah, I remember the pressure of like trying to get them to eat new things. And Mm -hmm. how important is that from your perspective? How important is it to get kids to eat a variety of food? Like where's the, where are the guidelines there? Right. That's a great question. So we know as humans, the more foods we eat, the more nutrients we get, right? And the broader nutrients we get, the more different fibers, which affects our gut. So when it comes to variety, more is better. That said, sometimes I find parents do have unrealistic expectations of what a child might try if they already are a picky eater. So, you know, I think in an ideal world, we expose the babies to a lot of foods and we continue that wide variety of exposure through toddlerhood and elementary, right, on and on. As real parents in the real world, we might go through phases where we can't serve a lot of variety. And we certainly have gone through those several times in the past couple of years as we moved. And In those cases, sometimes kids will stop eating foods that they previously liked, and then you have to help them to try new foods. I think the ultimate goal that we want in the end is kids who have the skill of being able to try new things, but that is a skill Mm -hmm. and that can develop over time. And for some kids, it's really hard to learn. It's very uncomfortable. And for other kids, it's easier. So if you have a kid who likes to try new things, keep building that skill if you can. And then if you do have a toddler, like you don't have to be losing sleep over this. Truly, Mm -hmm. like truly don't, don't lose any sleep over whether or not your child is trying new foods. That is a skill. We tell parents this all the time in the Better Bites Picky Eating Program. We're not even expecting your child to try new food until the very end of the program teaching, because it's a big thing. There's so much that goes into a child trying a new food that we never think of. So sometimes we're focused on, did they put the thing in their mouth? Did they swallow it? But in reality, if you're starting with, hey, I'm the parent, I'm putting the food on the table, that's the first step. That's the first step. And you won, you won. You get a gold star right there. And if your toddler looks at it, oh, guess what? They just got a good gold star for looking at it. I love that, looking at it. (laughs) Right. There's nothing that you have to go through those steps before you can get to trying a new food. And you have a lot of wins in between my child won't look at it and I don't even put it on the table to my child is actually tasting it. So I think focusing on those little wins along the way will help build your patience Mm -hmm. and help you feel more confident, right? Sometimes we're comparing ourselves to the kids who have adventurous eaters. I don't have adventurous eaters. I have a child who would have been an extreme picky eater and, you know, one who generally 
doesn't like eating, <laughs> although he'll <laughs> eat pretty much whatever. So, well, I was thinking also, I mean, just from having the wisdom of having, you know, numbered like decades of being a parent and seeing kids who like don't want to try that, try stuff when they're little, that mm -hmm. also sometimes isn't a factor of age. And like, you know, just because they're not trying new foods at four doesn't mean that they're not going to try new foods as they get older, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Many children grow out of picky eating, you know, most children, mm -hmm. not all of them. And I think that's one thing where we want to give like, I want to give all the parents listening a very easy answer, which is your child will grow out of it. Well, most of your children will grow out of it, mm -hmm. but there are some kids who don't, and they're going to need more support in order to gain those skills and even have the skills to continue to eat the variety that they have. So I think sometimes we hold on to those pat answers and we're like, it's just a phase, even though like it feels on the inside, like, ah, something's wrong. And the doctor says, oh, it's just a phase. And your friend says, oh, it's just a phase and blah, blah, blah. If you have a gut feeling that something is different about your child than most of the other kids you know, and you're just really feeling unease about it, it could be that your child has more challenges eating than other kids. But for the wide majority of children, they're going to go through and you're going to keep exposing them to foods and they're going to learn to try things and then they're going to learn to eat it. So I think coming back to that center of, you know, your child the best and you're gaining the skills that you can and you can help your child. And if something feels like it's wrong, explore other options. Mm -hmm. One thing that comes up a lot in, in with some of the families that I work with, and, and I actually saw this firsthand with a girlfriend of mine who has a child the same age as my youngest child, is sensory challenges around picky eating. And this, my friend's child, who's now 16-ish, or 16, and he, I saw him when he was, he, they came to visit us when he was about 12, and he was extreme picky eater. Mm -hmm. And I could see that he wanted to eat the things that everybody else was eating. Like mm -hmm. he really, it, he was grown past the point where he didn't care if he was a picky eater. You know what I mean? Like right. he was like, right. I want to, like, I had, she told me he only eats bagels, poppy seed bagels. So I'd gotten bagels, but I had gotten Montreal style bagels instead of grocery store right. style bagels. And I could tell he wanted to eat them, but he couldn't, like he couldn't right. eat them because right. he was, it was a sensory thing for him. Right. Right. So I guess I'm, I guess I tell that story and just maybe asking you to share like some of the reasons. I mean, I just mentioned sensory, mm -hmm. but like, are there other things why some kids might not grow out of their picky eating? Sure. Sure. That's one of them. So we have, you know, there's lots of causes for picky eating. There's genetic factors. There's, there's, you know, executive function factors. Is your child flexible? Is, 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 are they not, you know, we, if we look at a bowl of blueberries and we're not a picky eater, we know that there's going to be some sour berries and some sweet berries. We can handle that. We know what to expect. We've had enough experience with these blueberries, a child coming to those blueberries. They don't know that right? And so they have one blueberry that's delicious and then they're expecting all the other ones to be the same. Right. And then they taste one that's super sour. Whoa, that was unexpected. They didn't maybe didn't like that experience. It was uncomfortable to them in some way. And some kids will then say, I'm done with blueberries. Right. Other Never kids eating will a blueberry like, again. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. And other kids will say, okay, wow, that was an interesting experience. I want to try it again. What am I mm -hmm. going to get? Maybe they're curious, right? And so some kids, they are less flexible. They have less of an ability to kind of accept the variation of a size variation, a color variation. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have specialized techniques to help your child, they aren't necessarily going to develop those skills on their own. Mm -hmm. You know, kids who had 10 foods, as children often still have 10 foods as adults. And so, you know, in our, like we, I was just meeting with the occupational therapist on our team who basically walks parents through, like, how would you do feeding therapy with your own child? You know, you're exposing your child, but you're also exposing them to other foods that look very similar. And you're trying to build that skill of, yeah, they will eat a cheese it only, but could we get them eating a Cheez-It 
that has some pepper on it, right? right. Whatever the, the next, you know, yeah, flaming, yeah. flaming hot, you know, whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> so, you know, we really need to help kids get that because again, yeah, your child might be able to get all the nutrients that they need if they're a picky eater. Extreme picky eating is a little more difficult, but let's say, you know, some people say it's fine. They're getting what they need. We don't need to push them. Which right, like if I, they eat like if they right. eat fruit, but they're not eating mm-hmm. vegetables, they're still getting right. like yeah. Right. Which is fine, right? That's that's fine. We're doing okay. We're getting those plant foods in. The problem is your child might have social implications. We just did uh, a group discussion with some other parents in our program with older kids. And one of them said, you know, my child wants to go to camp, but she can't because there's no food that she can eat Mm -hmm. for the week. And she really wants to go, but she doesn't have those skills yet. And so we really do want to help kids. We want to strike that balance of we're doing okay, right? We are good parents. We always have to start with that. Mm -hmm. We're doing okay. Our kid has a challenge. We didn't give them that challenge. They came with that challenge and we're learning techniques to help them. It's going to take some time, but we don't necessarily want to leave them in that challenge if we have the capacity. Now, there are totally times where you're like, guess what? Backseat. Right. I'm fine with apple slices and baby carrots. I am fine with this. This is fine. Maybe they're not eating a vegetable. I'm giving them a vitamin, whatever I'm doing, Mm -hmm. right? We just have to remember that we have to look at our own capacity. If we don't have the capacity, it's not there. It's not a time to feel guilty either. I love that you brought that up because so often this is like becomes a parent shame point, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm not feeding my kid those, the, you know, pictures of like the little bento boxes of all the snacks and the rainbow and that kind of thing. So I love that you brought that up. Just to like go back to another thing you said about the flexibility. I think like just from my experience, I think parents would see that in other areas of a child's life as well, not just with eating, right? Like they would see that they Potentially. Yeah. yeah. You know, sometimes sometimes we'll see like anxiety and anxiety is another huge trigger. We'll see anxiety only with food Hmm. and not necessarily in other areas. I think kids are very complicated. And so you may find that they can be flexible with how their sock feels, mm-hmm. but they can't be flexible with how their pants feel. Right. Or they can be flexible with, you know, whatever it is, their toys or, or something, but they can't be flexible with eating. So you don't necessarily always see mm-hmm. it, but you mm-hmm. might in some other ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another thing that you said, which actually was sort of like brings up a question that I wanted to ask you next, which is a hard question. So I hope you don't mind sure. <laughs> a bit of a hard question. Yeah. When you talked about the, you know, the girl who wanted to go to camp, who couldn't go because there wasn't food there that she could eat. That to me is totally so different than, so a t- say, a tw- I don't know. If, did you say she was 12 or did I just imagine that? <laughs> I I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know for she's sure. She's probably a little bit she older. She might have been 12. Okay, let's say yeah, she's 12. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's just make that up. So she, so yeah. a 12-year-old who wants to go to camp and actively wants to embrace like feeding therapy and eating different things so that their life is better is mm-hmm. different to me than a four-year-old who, and just bear with me because I am going someplace with this, is yeah. different to me than a four-year-old who's fine with eating all of the same things that they normally eat and is not interested in broadening the variety of foods that they eat. And the reason why I sort of started thinking about this was I did I did a summit a couple of months ago and two of the people that I interviewed for the summit, one of them was an occupational therapist and he wasn't talking about food at all. He was talking about occup- like sensory, he was talking about like exposure therapy for sen- sensory stuff, like whether you can tolerate, you know, walking on grass with bare feet. And he said that he's really for that if it's something that the child wants but that he doesn't believe in doing sensory exposure if it's just coming from outside the child that everybody else in their life thinks they should be able to walk on grass bare feet, but basically child-led exposure therapy. And the other person that I interviewed was an, an ARFID expert. And for people who don't know what that is, it's, is it, can you, can you help me out with what that stands for? ARFID? ARFID is Avoidant Restrictive Feeding Intake Disorder. Okay, thank you for that. I forgot what the, what it stood for. Mm-hmm. So she talked about how a lot of similarly, like that a lot of picky eaters, the only people who thought it was a problem were the people who were outside of the picky eaters, right? That the picky mm-hmm. eaters themselves were fine with it being, with being quote picky, right? Mm-hmm. And that there are a lot of adults who are happy with the, you know, few, few meals that they like to eat and they're, they're fine with that. Mm-hmm. So I guess I was wondering if you could 
help us as parents, like when, where's the line between like, we're doing feeding therapy for a four-year-old because we're really worried that they don't eat enough of a variety of things. And it sort of becomes like more pressury versus just waiting and, and seeing. Does that question make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. This is something that we've talked internally as a team with the OTs about because it is a question. And this is, here's the question that I kind of put out there. If your child is not going to be able to go to camp and your family is not going to be able to go on vacation, and this is a huge stress and they can't meet their nutritional needs and they can't go over to their friend's house, you know, is this what you really want? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, did we take it too far? Did Mm -hmm. we take it too far? I think one of the most important things that we can give our children is the ability to tolerate discomfort. Mm -hmm. That is hard. And as adults, it's the same thing. And I feel like in our society where we can get answers instantly, we can get our Amazon delivery today. We can, everything is easy. Everything's been made so easy for us. We can't tolerate discomfort. And our children have extraordinarily high rates of anxiety and depression, and they can't, they're not very resilient. We see this, my husband's a a professor and he sees his students, like they can't handle, (laughs) they can't handle the normal ups and downs of a class. Right. Their parents are calling. Why did you give them a C? Yeah. 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 He hasn't had a parent call yet. He's just, (laughs) he's waiting. He's Mm -hmm. like, it's going to come. Right. They can't handle it. So here's the thing. Here's the thing that that we always think about, what we've talked about on our team, and we've decided our program has always been no pressure. Mm -hmm. This means we are not, we are not using techniques that have been used in the past in feeding therapy, where we are forcing a child to try a new food. We are, we are inflicting, like you said, our ideas and our goals onto our child. At the same time, are we going to leave our kids? Are we going to leave our kids right where they are? Mm -hmm. Is that really what we want? Mm -hmm. Philosophically, myself as a parent and the, the, you know, the other professionals and specialists in our program, we don't think so. We Mm -hmm. don't want to leave our kids in their anxiety. And we know there's an anxiety spiral, right? You get anxious from something, something happened, you become anxious Now I'm afraid of it. So I don't expose myself. Now when I see it, I become afraid of it again. Right. And you're spinning yourself into more and more anxiety. I have seen that in my own life. Mm -hmm. Something happened and all of a sudden I find myself entirely risk averse. Mm -hmm. Is that what I want for my life? Mm -hmm. Absolutely Mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. You know, if my child has a math anxiety and that's causing them to not be able to learn math, am I going to leave them in that anxiety? No. Yeah. And guess what? That's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to have to happen. They're going to have to be a little bit uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. But my job as a parent is to find that edge, that loving edge where I'm pushing my child a little bit, but I'm also not pushing them too far. Mm-hmm. And as parents, I feel like we're always doing this. We're teaching our kids. That can be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, we're setting boundaries with our kids. That's super (laughs) uncomfortable (laughs) for everyone involved. But this is really important for development. Do we have to have a child that eats 50 foods? No. Mm -hmm. But I want to, I would love to see that child be able to meet their nutritional needs. And that's not necessarily happening. I just read a research paper about, the prevalence of scurvy oh, no. in kids. And this is most often seen in extreme picky eaters. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we've just added a nutrition analysis to our program because we want to know, like, is your kid meeting their nutritional needs? Mm-hmm. If they are, great, right? And you can feel a sense of relief. If they're not, also great, because you know that this is important so that they can meet their nutrition needs. Yeah. And we feel pretty passionately that we can help parents not pressure their children, but give them opportunities that allow them to explore those boundaries that allow them to get up and take that first step and also fall down. Mm -hmm. Right. It's uncomfortable to learn how to walk. 
but also kids can do it. They can, mm-hmm. they can have that little space. Yeah. I mean, we've had kids totally melt down at the sight of a bell pepper, mm-hmm. like truly melt down at looking at it. Mm-hmm. Right. But seeing bell peppers is part of life. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, it sounds like, you know? first of all, it sounds like you're not approaching this from the angle of, okay. So one thing that I worry about when I hear people, people talking about the the food exposure is that it's actually being driven more by the idea of diet culture than it is right, driven right. by like they want their kids to eat like a 50% fruits and vegetables yeah. and like only a quarter carbs and a quarter protein yeah, or, you know right, or whatever right. right like it's being driven by that rather than what you're talking about where it's being driven more by almost by like emotional like mental health like, yeah, you know, being absolutely. able to being able to be flexible, being able to be go in different places. And, and I really like that distinction because sometimes I think it is sometimes I think that food exposure is is just like a tricky like diet culture in disguise mm-hmm. sort of thing. Sure. It absolutely can be. I do find that the people there are some extreme perspectives coming out, which, again, it's like the kid can eat whatever, whenever. And. The problem is we forget that there's other influences on our kids, Mm -hmm. specifically food marketing. Mm -hmm. Like companies have designed foods to make kids want them, to get their parents to buy them. We're up against a $2 billion industry that's trying to get our kids to like a very specific set of foods. We were at the grocery store one day and my daughter, when she was five, saw some Dora spaghettios i didn't yep. even know that they were like dora spaghettios but please 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 can we buy those and i was like yeah. okay and she hated right. them actually right <laughs> they were horrible right but yeah like the cartoon yeah. characters on right. on food right so we have to remember there's two sides to a good relationship with food one is a good emotional relationship and mental health relationship with our body right where there are We're not thinking in terms of bad food, good food, right? And then also on the other side of a good relationship with food is our ability to meet our nutrition needs Mm -hmm. and our ability to participate in the social activities that we want to participate in by being able to eat the food. So there's several aspects to a relationship with food that I feel like aren't getting billing. So Mm -hmm. how we eat food and how we think about food is important. Also, what we eat is important. Right. And so we have to hold those two things. It's two sides of the same coin. And we want to really have a strong sense of body positivity and weight neutral perspectives of bodies. That's going to be core to your child's relationship with food. And then we also want to be providing that variety of foods. And if we have a kid who's really struggling, we want to learn those techniques to be able to help them expand enough that they can meet their nutrition needs and participate in the social experiences they want to have. Yeah. So that's all very helpful. And I think we sort of made a natural transition into talking about nutritional needs, which we have talked about a little bit already. But I guess I just wanted to ask you, like, again, with that, like, is it, are we put, are some people like, you know, some influencers or people that I see not on your account, but like other accounts or whatever, or parents who come to me with their, with their fears about, you know, my kid's not eating enough fruits or vegetables, is that, because they really need to eat as much as sometimes parents think they do for the nutritional needs? Or is, again, this is like that diet culture in disguise thing that, so where is that? Like, I, where, how can we tell? I mean, you mentioned getting tested, testing, but if somebody's not, maybe if they're not an extreme picky eater, how can you tell if your kid is getting enough right, right. enough of their nutritional needs it's met? It's so hard. <laughs> yeah, I it's just so asked you a hard. easy question, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think, yes, there can be some outward deficiencies that show up, but you really have to be kind of an extreme picky eater to see those. And we know that there's some big areas where most kids in the United States are not meeting their nutrition needs. So we know fiber, we know vitamin D, we know some of these things, right? Where, you know, you might want to ask your child's practitioner if a vitamin D supplement is a good idea, or you may want to consider, you know, some sort of fish oil supplement if your child is not eating fatty fish twice a week. So there's th- some things like that where from the public health perspective, we just know a lot of kids aren't getting the fiber that we need. they need to kind of build their gut and kind of 
for heart health and mental health and that sort of thing. Can so, I just ask you, sorry, yeah. what, what kind of foods are you talking about when you say sure. that they're not getting enough fiber? Like what would, um, yeah, what would those so be? whole grains, fruits and vegetables, seeds and nuts, those are kind of the the big ones where we're going to get a lot of fiber. And those are the foods that pig eaters tend to not eat, mm-hmm. right? Doesn't mean you need to be freaking out about it, especially if your kid doesn't have constipation or something like that. No, we don't need to be freaking out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, the internet wants us to freak out. The news wants us to freak out because then we'll do whatever they want. We don't have to be freaking out about this. I, I remember a parent in one of my Instagram Q and A's said, you know, do I have to care that my kid is a picky eater? And the answer is no, mm-hmm. you don't have to care about anything. Mm -hmm. you decide what you want to care about. And if nutrition is something that's important to you and you feel like, yeah, you know, my kid isn't getting the fiber that they need. And I'd really like to work on that. You can care. You can care about that. So while we want to have these really extreme perspectives of it just doesn't matter what our kids eat or it extremely, I need to be up late at night making whole foods and sprouting my grains and making my own yogurt. It matters everything. We have to find what we're comfortable with in the middle because how we eat and our relationship with our body and food really matters. And also what we eat does matter. It's two sides of the same coin. And, you know, there's some parents like, you know, if we go extreme, we think, oh, there's there's no bad foods and it doesn't matter if my kid eats tons and tons of sugar. Well, even if you're not part of diet culture, eating tons and tons of sugar actually has an effect. It does mm-hmm. have an effect on the body outside of weight. Mm-hmm. And so you can care about both those things. You can care about your child having a good relationship with sweets and not thinking they're bad and and not demonizing them. And you can also be aware of how much sugar your child is eating. And if you feel like it's too much, you can cut back on that. Both things can be true at the same time. And that balance is going to look different. Maybe you have a child who has a medical need or sugar makes them crazy or, you know, just based on your culture, it's, it's something that you don't want to eat that much of. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm not going to tell you what's okay for your family to eat or not, Mm -hmm. you know, I always like to use the example of cultural practices. Nobody blinks an eye that a vegetarian family has chosen to be vegetarian for ethical reasons. Nobody blinks an eye because like, oh my gosh, they really care and that's so important to them. Of course, they're going to raise their children vegetarian. But at the same time, if there's a family that wants to limit sugary things, they're like, oh my gosh, that's diet culture. Mm -hmm. Well, Maybe they have reasons. Mm-hmm. Maybe they want don't want to buy soda because they don't want to, you know, participate in that industry. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what to care about or what's important to you or what to restrict or what not to. I feel like that is your job to determine what your values are. And it's okay to have food values. It's also okay. And it's important, in my opinion, not to demonize other people's choices, yeah. whether that's giving their kids all the cookies they want all the time and they're always there, or whether it's only having cookies occasionally. We can't be demonizing the other other side. Mm -hmm. It's so important to have all these different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's also a very nice segue into good food and bad food (laughs) that we were, we were, that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about. So you sort of touched on, touched on it a little bit, but what do you, Like, what do you tell families who are really concerned about, you know, I mean, when I say good food, I'm talking about low on sugar, unprocessed food. I mean, that's what generally people think of as like, you know, I, that's not healthy. Like I hear parents Mm -hmm. saying like, we're not going to eat that because it's not healthy. So, and then, you know, I, I, I loved your post on chicken nuggets and how, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not horrible to have a bag of chicken nuggets in your freezer for, for what the myriad of reasons that people might feed their kids chicken nuggets. Right. Um, so how do you help parents navigate that? You know, again, there's the diet culture influenced like bad food and good food and, and even not, you know, maybe even not diet. Well, I don't know if you can separate these out, but when you were talking about, you know, families that don't eat sugar, I don't know if it's necessarily from diet culture that sugar is demonized, but definitely sugar is demonized. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of reasons it's demonized. And I think a lot of them do come from 
diet culture. But I think what's important to know is in the research literature that we have so far, many of the researchers from the studies they've done have concluded that classifying a group of foods as bad is actually not healthy. Mm -hmm. Like it's mentally can really contribute to disordered eating. There's not as much evidence and I've not seen any strong evidence that calling foods healthy does that. At the same time, I do not recommend calling them either. One, yeah. the words are meaningless. What are we saying? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a soda might be unhealthy to me personally because I feel terrible after I have one, but it could be life-saving to a child with type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Peanuts are great, great snack. My family, I mean, my kids are like, 5% peanuts, um, <laughs> but they could be deathly for another right. child, unhealthy. So what are we even telling kids when we're saying healthy or unhealthy? Well, I always think it's weird. I think it's also weird to use healthy, unhealthy, just because if you do let your kids have a cookie, are you then saying like, I'm giving you unhealthy food, child? Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's and so it's weird. Okay. Yeah, it's okay to be kind of unhealthy. Yeah. Like, it's so weird. Like it's just like, I will, yeah. I will sometimes be a good parent and give you, you know, a good parent and give you healthy right, food. Right, right. And sometimes I'm going to be a bad parent and give you unhealthy food. Like that's just weird to me. Let's celebrate our birthdays with unhealthy, yeah, unhealthy exactly, things. Exactly. Uh, like why do healthy foods taste bad and yeah. unhealthy foods take, taste yeah. good? You know, and it also triggers this like rebellion and some kids like, oh, it's healthy and not going to eat it. Mm -hmm. Right. I, there's, it's so problematic on so many different levels that I just really think we need to let that one go. Mm -hmm. Totally. Can we have a healthy diet? Sure, that's actually a little different. And a healthy diet includes a variety of foods. Because again, to that kid allergic to peanuts, they need to know they're allergic to peanuts and mm -hmm. they need to keep that unhealthy food out of their diet, mm -hmm. right? So it's okay for kids to know that certain foods work for their body and different foods work for different people. My kids know I'm allergic to salmon, so they're not gonna make me eat it. They mm -hmm. know that if I eat dairy, I'm gonna be super sleepy and I may have to take a nap. I don't know. These things just happen and they know. I have another kid who's like, I don't feel good when I eat yogurt or cheese. Mm -hmm. So he chooses not to eat very much dairy because he just doesn't like how he feels. But in our, it doesn't mean dairy is bad and we both still eat, eat it sometimes, but it's not bad. And yet it's not necessarily always healthy for us. Right. So I think like when my kid comes home and he said, he said from school is such and such healthy. I just asked questions like, oh, what do you mean by healthy? Mm -hmm. He didn't really know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? He didn't really know. Like, what does that mean? And my response almost always is, well, would we be healthy if we only ate cookies? Mm -hmm. Even kids, super, super young, they know. They mm -hmm. know that you're not going to be healthy. But then I always follow it up with, what if we only ate broccoli? And they also know. Yeah. I'm not going to be healthy if I only eat broccoli. Yeah. So I think giving them the perspective, there's a lot of nuance in this word healthy. They're going to hear it all the time. So we have to be ready. We have to be ready with an answer. Yeah. Foods are different. Yeah. These things are true, but also we're not going to judge these foods. We're going to call them by their name. You know, we may group them by what they do in our body. That's a huge thing for us. Like, Information gives autonomy. Autonomy is a key pillar of mental health. Mm -hmm. So when we give kids information about food, especially positive information, as long as we can, we're empowering them. And I think we really need to stay away. I mean, based on the research I've read so far, and of course it can always change, but based on what I've read so far, you know, categorizing food as unhealthy is unhealthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we really need to get away from that. So do you talk about, I mean, one thing that that I talked about with my kids was just like sometimes food. Like, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we eat like, you know, sh like cookies and cakes and ice cream and sometimes we eat chips, but we just don't eat those every day. Like, how would you, is that a good way to talk about it? Do you think? Not you know, that it matters anymore. There's, to me, right, right, right. <laughs> right. I mean, a lot of people like to do that. I generally just don't say that because mm -hmm. I just kind of by osmosis figure out, oh, sometimes we don't have ice cream in the, in the freezer, whereas we always have other things. Again, that can very quickly kind of veer into the sort of like, oh, those foods must be bad. Not mm -hmm. always. 
And I don't like to nitpick every single word that parents are using. Mm -hmm. Do you have a way to talk about it like that you recommend though? So say- Yeah, I would just recommend not say, not calling it a sometimes food or an always food or a grow food or a green food or a red food. What if (laughs) the kid says though, like, can you like- can we get some ice oh, cream? Like if you, sure. did, you know, I mean, what we did was just like, we bought ice cream. Sometimes we ate it till it was gone or we made right. cookies. Sometimes we ate yeah. until they were yeah. gone and right. we just didn't do it every day. But yeah. at the same time, I wouldn't have like, if we went grocery shopping, I wouldn't buy ev- ice cream every single time I yeah. went grocery shopping. Yeah. But how do you explain that to your sure. kids? That's a great question. So some of the things I like to do is when they're really young, just say, oh, that's not on the list. Mm-hmm. That's a good enough answer. You don't have to really get into the why. Just, oh, that's not on the list right now. Older kids might say, why? You say, oh, because we just had it. We want to eat a variety of foods. That's also an okay answer. It's putting a positive spin on why are we doing it? The true answer is because we want to eat a a wide variety of foods. Or you can say, oh, we're going to get that next week. Or you could say, we're saving, you know, maybe we're not in the grocery store, but we're at home. Oh, we're saving this so that we have it. Uh, on Friday when we have a party, right. or we're going to have more of that X, Y, Z, you're going to do the same thing with prunes, mm-hmm. right? You're not going to let your kid eat a ton of prunes. You're going to say, <laughs> do they like to eat a ton of prunes? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, same thing with, you know, so there's this sort of, if you buy $18 blueberries, you're going to limit those. Yeah. If you run out of chicken, you're going to limit it. Mm-hmm. It, you know, you might say, oh, we've been eating a lot of rice. We're going to have this different grain. We have to remember we're doing this with a lot of different foods. Mm-hmm. Don't do this sort of activity only with sugary things. I love that. Do it with other foods too. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I grew up with four siblings. You better believe we all learned how to divide and count <laughs> items really young to make sure everybody got the same amount of garlic bread because there was Mm -hmm. one loaf of bread Mm -hmm. and there was a whole family. So these experiences of sometimes having limited options and sometimes being able to eat as much as you want of all different foods, it's preparing them for life, Mm -hmm. right? Life where sometimes you're going to go to a birthday party and you'll be able to eat one cupcake. Sometimes you're going to go to a birthday party and you'll be able to eat as many as you want. Do our kids have the skills to navigate both of those? Mm -hmm. The discomfort of maybe not eating as many as you wanted. And also that's kind of being in tune with their body. Do I want three cupcakes? Great. I'm going to have three cupcakes or five cupcakes, whatever. Also other times being like, oh, you know what? I only want one cupcake. Are we giving them the skills to be able to make that choice for themselves? You know, being able to listen to what do I really want? Mm -hmm. You know, how how do I feel? Do I want to be really full of of cupcakes right now? And the answer to that many times is going to be yes. And the answer to that other times is going to be no, but we have to give them the ability to listen to their body so that they can experience, have all those experiences. That makes a lot of sense. So the last thing I wanted to ask you about was when kids eat too much or too little in quotes, right? Too much or too little. How do you support families around that? Like I, I, I have families who do the division of responsibility, but then they feel super nervous that their kid is eating like, you know, five pieces of bread or, Mm -hmm. or whatever, or they, they really like the dinner you gave them. And even if it's not just bread, they eat like, you know, say you made like lasagna and they have Mm -hmm. like four pieces of lasagna. I guess mostly I hear about kids who are whose parents feel like they're yeah. eating quote too much. Yeah. So how do you how do you balance that? Because I do know that just what I've heard is the more you try to get kids to eat less, the more they eat. And the mm-hmm. when you try to get them to eat more, they eat less. Yeah. Yeah. As a parent of a kid who struggled to stay on the growth chart, I feel your pain. <laughs> I feel that pain. You know, if you've got a kid who's not eating enough, it's really important. You can't just let that go. You also need to cook very, you need to learn how to cook really high calorie food. Because again, if you're pressuring a child to eat, if you're force feeding them, guess what they're going to do whenever you're not doing that? They're not going to eat. Right. So just like you said, you pressure a kid who's not eating enough to eat more, they are going to eat less. That's not what you want. So what you're going to do as the parent is you're going to modify what you offer and every bite that you make available to them, you're going to make it as high calories as it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. When we're talking, it gets a little more complicated when we're talking about a child at a high weight, because all of a sudden we enter into diet culture realm, right? Fear. Yeah. Fear. We have, so many of us have just this deep seated fear and bias and prejudice against bigger bodies. Mm -hmm. 
right? We cannot let that affect our children Mm -hmm. to the best of our ability. This is everywhere. When we internalize that weight bias, that's the seed of disordered eating. That is the seed of eating disorders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're thinking about what your child is eating, you feel that they're eating too much. You got to really check yourself. Why? Why are you concerned? Mm -hmm. Are you concerned because because you don't want them to be bigger? Mm -hmm. It's not our job to police the size of our kids' bodies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're working against the medical system in many ways when we take that perspective. At the same time, is high weight, can high weight be an actual risk? Yeah, it can be a risk factor, right? But we have to remember genetics are going to play a role in this. Some people are naturally going to be and it's not, And it's not always a risk factor, right? Well, it's always a risk factor, but it doesn't always have any risk to your child, if that right. makes okay. sense. Yes. So, right? that, yeah, so it's right. considered a risk factor. But it doesn't, that there are bigger is, bodies that are healthy. And absolutely. As, just like right. there are smaller bodies that are not healthy. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. So you got the kid who's fallen off the growth chart and the, you know, the pediatricians are on your case, but really they're healthy and they're always healthy and they're just super, super small. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing for big kids, right? They, there are plenty of kids who are going to be healthy. This is what their body is. They can be healthy throughout life. This is just how it is. Again, it's not your job to try to change the weight of your child. Mm -hmm. And by focusing on that, you are missing everything else we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about variety. We're talking about a child having a good relationship with food. We're talking about, you know, you feeling good about what you put on the table. And so rather than focusing on their weight, it's a good opportunity, just like you're not going to focus on the weight of a kid who's falling off the growth chart. You're going to focus on what you're serving. Now, you're not going to take out all sugar. You're not going to take out all snacks. And you're not going to take out all, quote, junk food. You're not going to do that, right? You can't. That's not helpful. It's not going to, it's not going to help anybody's health to do that. But you can look at what you're feeding your family and say, do I like the variety that's available to my family. Does my child have the ability to eat all food groups? Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to be important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything we do at Kids Eating Color is weight neutral, meaning we talk about lifestyle and that's for all children. We talk Mm -hmm. about the sleep. We talk about, you know, trying to be active if that's accessible to a family. It's going to be the same regardless of the size of your child. We're going to try to have family meals to the best of our ability and our capability and our resources. We are going to, as parents, we're going to provide the food that's in our home and that's at the meals. We are going to make food available at certain times that are predictable and kids know where that is coming and they they can feel secure in that. And we're also going to have an eating place where kids can eat and they can learn to enjoy their food and eat mindfully, right? That's our job as parents, regardless of the size of our child. Mm -hmm. It's also our job to let our kids listen to their body, to help them, to give them that space to get in touch with their internal cues and to say, oh, I'm hungry. Oh, I'm full. They may eat more than you like. It's your job to get over that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) I love that. Now, if a child is is eating a lot of one food, take meals where you don't serve that food. Mm-hmm. You don't have to make that food available at every single meal. If your child is only eating fruit, never, ever, ever eating veggies, if there's fruit there, have some meals where you don't serve fruit and you mm-hmm. only serve veggies, right? If your child is only eating bread, now for many kids, that is a safe food and so and it's a nice addition to a meal. But let's say you don't have a picky eater, your kid is only eating bread. Well, have some meals where there's no bread available and there's other, there's a potato, there's a different sort of starch, Mm -hmm. right? As the parent, you don't have to make every food available all the time. And like I said before, there may be certain foods in your house where they, you know, they're always in limited quantities. Like I was saying prunes, you know, guess what? (laughs) I'm not going to let you eat as many prunes as you want. I will always put I will always police that um, as long as I'm involved. Right, right. 
you want to do that when you're 18, fine, have fun. But, you know, so it's okay to have some boundaries around food and to say, oh, hey, you know, we're going to have two cookies tonight. But I would really encourage you to think, when other, what are other times where I'm also going to let my child eat as many cookies as they want mm-hmm. so that they're not feeling deprived and they're not feeling restricted? You know, we do have to have the ability to cope with boundaries and restriction, but we also need the ability to eat our fill mm-hmm. and to feel that there is variety and abundance. And right. So our kids need both of that. And if you're finding that your child is feeling very restricted, yeah, they're going to binge eat. Yeah, they're going to hide and eat food. Yeah, they're they're going to, you know, eat more than they would normally if they're feeling restricted. Mm-hmm. So you really have to be in tune with your child. And if they are feeling restricted, you need to say, OK, how can I back off of this restriction so that my child feels comfortable and they feel that they can get what they need? I would never, you know, outside of some kind of ex- more extreme circumstances, you know, restricting your child's portion size, like... If well, everything I've that, read be, just, you know, everything I've read just said that really leads to disordered eating. And yeah. that's, you know, and I, I guess another, a big part of what you're talking about, which just makes total sense is managing your own fear as a parent, right? Like managing yeah. your own fear. Right. And as you said, get over it. If you've got a fear of your child being in a bigger body. Yeah. I mean, um, really, truly. And I, I just want to add one thing. There are children who need medical intervention, whether they're uh, small or big. And there are parents who have chosen to maybe engage in in a, a pediatric weight loss program or a, a medication regimen or, you know, maybe even bariatric surgery, right? There are parents who do that because they're weighing all the options that they have and they feel that this is best for their child. At Kids Eating Color, we always support parents navigating these very tricky situations. And I think if a parent has chosen to take this path, this is not judgment on that parent. Mm -hmm. We know parents are just in really tricky situations. Mm -hmm. And as best as you can, if you are navigating a situation like that, where you are addressing weight, then we want to do this in a way that is kind of decreasing the focus on weight and increasing the focus on health as much as possible so that their kid is having less internalized body weight bias uh, mm-hmm. as possible. It's tricky. It's yeah, really it is, tricky. It it's so tricky. hard. <laughs> but as parents, we got to give ourselves grace and we got to do what we need to do as best as we can. Yeah. I, um, I've been really going kind of down a rabbit hole and fi- finding this all very tricky because I have a 16 year old child who has ADHD and I'm finding that, and we don't, this is a topic for a different podcast, but I'm finding that, you know, there's like this contradiction between encouraging mindful eating for somebody who has impulsive ADHD, (laughs) while at the same time, not wanting to restrict any kinds of Mm -hmm. food or eating or portions is very, very, very tricky. (laughs) Absolutely. We've, I've been doing a lot of reading on the same topic because sometimes we tell parents, oh, if they have a good relationship with food, they're never going to binge eat. They're never going to sneak food. Guess what? If you have a kid with ADHD, they will absolutely mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. binge eat or sneak food. That's their biochemistry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they're <laughs> That's looking their for the dopamine, right? Yeah. They're looking for the yeah. dopamine. Hit. And, you know, food has been developed to do that. So, yeah. yeah, if you have a child who's not neurotypical, you may have different needs in your house. And you mm-hmm. may say, you know what? We're going to have a little bit of restriction. We're going to do that in as positive a way as possible. We're going to do it in a body positive way. We're not going to focus on weight. But we are going to say, yeah, the rule is, you know, two cookies a day or mm-hmm. two pieces of candy or, you know, and again, we have to navigate this, that, you know, so many of these in internet conversations, most of the internet conversations don't talk about kids. They lack nuance. Who are yeah. neuro, neuro. Oh, yeah. Who aren't, do, yeah. right? Right. Mm-hmm. You have neurodivergence. Nobody's applying this. Does yeah. the division responsibility work in the same way? No, I think it looks a little bit different. Yeah. A lot different? No. Yeah. I don't think it is a lot different, but I do think it's a little different. And we have, kids are sick. Kids have chronic diseases. Mm-hmm. Kids are, are neurodivergent, like all these things. Mm-hmm. How are we going to adjust our parenting again to give them autonomy, to help them trust their body, and also 
to help them be healthy based on these other needs that they have. Yeah. It's tricky for us. There it is, is a lot of nuance. It's so tricky. I, I, and I also like to say, if you're going to try something, try it. Mm-hmm. Try it. Be confident in trying it. But watch what happens. Yeah. And if it is not going well and your child is becoming obsessed with food, change your strategy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I it's found okay. with, with my daughter, because she's 16, I was able to just, I finally just talked to her about that. Like, I was just like, look, there's this one school of thought about intuitive eating and intuitive feeding. And this is what that is. And then also I've been doing research about ADHD and this is like the brain's response to dopamine and eating and blah, blah, blah. So, so like, Hey, we have to be able to have conversation. It actually went really yeah, well. Like it was right. really, and I finally felt a little bit of peace that I've right, been looking for right. for the past couple of years around that. And it took me a while to realize where that conflict was coming from. Right. Right. Like, cause right. I was just like uncomfortable in both ways about mm-hmm. talking about food with her. So, right. Um, but you're giving her autonomy, mm-hmm. right. And she's mm-hmm. old enough that she can kind of hold that nuance. Mm-hmm. And when you give your child autonomy in an age appropriate information in an age appropriate way, you're giving them autonomy. And now she's saying, okay, yeah, my brain is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. How do I want to, how do I want to handle this? How am I going to find balance? How am I going to find variety and also not deprive myself? And yeah. she's, as she gets older, she is going to have to find that balance for herself as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Totally. All right. One final question. This has been a great conversation. This is a question I ask all my guests at the end of the podcast, which is if you could go back in time to your younger parent self, what advice would you give yourself? I think my number one is it doesn't matter if your child is upset with you. Mm, That's a good one. (laughs) So we do so many things to prevent our child from getting upset or prevent them from having the tantrum or you know, and I feel like it interferes with our ability to lovingly, but very firmly hold a boundary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once I was like, oh, it's truly okay if they're mad at me for that. Once I realized that, ah, that was so freeing. Yeah. Like, oh, it's great. (laughs) They're angry. That's okay. They're allowed to have their feelings. They're allowed to be angry. I can still be the parent and hold that boundary and I can support them. Mm -hmm. I can support them when they're angry and having a tantrum, but I don't have to do things to prevent that tantrum. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's good. You know, there's strategies to prevent tantrums, but what I really mean is, you know, I don't have to prevent them from getting angry at me or, you know, not being popular. Right. What I always always say to parents is sometimes like you, you know, you look at a limit that you're setting and if you're, you know, it's dangerous if you're not setting it because you're uncomfortable with their reactions, right? And that's what you're getting at. That's exactly what I'm Mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jennifer. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, where can I, I mean, we've talked about kids eating color a lot, but where's (laughs) the best place for people to go and find out more about you and what you do? Yeah. So you can follow us on Instagram or, you know, all the other fun places that people hang out. You can also go to kidseatingcolor.com and that's where you'll find you know, our learning center, our programs and things like that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.